I've called this message Sacred Spaces in Anxious Times. And I'm going to read a few verses that um, Jesus said to his disciples as he was getting them ready as, you know, for his crucifixion and he was about to leave them and then rise from the dead. And it's in John 14, verse 27. And Jesus, I'll say, start with 26. Jesus said, But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything that I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. I'll say it again. He says, I'm leaving with you a gift, peace of mind and heart. And then he goes on, you know, as he's still talking to them in John 16, verse verse 33, and he says, I have told you all this, which is so much more than that verse. It's about abiding and the, the reality of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Spirit. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And there is no way that Jesus is saying, look, peace out, rock on. It's going to suck down here, but don't worry, it'll be good in eternity. He's not saying that. He is equipping a, a young group of disciples. They estimate that the disciples were from teenagers to maximum age 30. This is a young group of followers. The, the early followers of Christ were outliers. They were slaves. They were women. They were people of different ethnicities. They were Gentiles. And he's saying to them, I'm giving you a special gift of peace. And I know outside there, it's it's going to have its problems. And when we read the book of Acts, we read about, you know, the growth, the explosion, the persecution, the scattering, you know, the division, the challenges. We read about all the challenges that were to come. And in it all, Jesus said, I'm giving you the gift of peace. And he teaches how to abide in him and, and how we need the person of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not a force. He is a person, more real than you and I sitting here today. I I think it's not an understatement to say we're living in pretty troubled times. Wouldn't you agree? Anybody agree? And anxiety, you know, even in Australia, is, is, is pretty much on an edge. And it tips pretty easily. Like if you look at office behaviour now compared to three years ago, you're like, what the heck is happening here? You know, just what can make us lose a fuse or throw us out. The last couple of years, if I can just, you know, zoom in on our life here, you know, in Australia and around different parts of the world, you know, during the pandemic, normal life problems didn't go away, did they? They remained and continued as they do. And then you add to that, um, Uncertainty right now, we have uncertainty around food prices, petrol prices, interest rates going up with extraordinarily high mortgages that people have had to get to buy into the housing market, job security, supply chain. You might want to buy a car, but good luck getting one because they can't get them out here. People in the building industry, very challenged because supplies can't come. And when they do come, they've doubled and the knock-on and the knock-on and the knock-on effect just of supply chain in our economy. This is the real world that you and I live in. Um, Security, you put the news on to see the war in Ukraine and what's happening there and the knock-on, the knock-on and in the Pacific and China and will Australia and who are we doing deals with? I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty going on. And then you add to that what is called the long tail of COVID. Sorry, this isn't a news update at church to depress you this morning. But in case you're going, why am I a little bit antsy? And why am I a little bit on edge? And why are things a little bit feisty? And why am feeling Lucinda focused on church health? I'll tell you why. Because the world we're living in is peaking with anxiety. It's scared and it's frightened. And that's why we need to be a community that aren't like, praise the Lord, it's all good. But no, in the midst of this, Jesus said He would give us His peace. It's a gift. He's going to be with us. He will steer us through the realities of when we find ourselves in troubled times. 
Last December, I was sitting in a meeting with our federal member here in the hills, Alex Hawke. He pulled together all the mental health service agencies and we talked about youth in the hills and the mental health of youth and, and the escalation of very serious problems and what we could do as a community. And he said something at the end of that meeting which I hadn't heard and I didn't really want to hear. And he said, look, there's a thing called the long tail of COVID. And we think we're coming out of it because, you know, we're getting, you know, back into the shops and, you know, you can start regrouping again. But he said, you know, we're expecting this thing, the effects of this pandemic to spike in 18 months time. So we're talking about mental health, mental wellness. He said, mid 2023, we're expecting whew, as just the delayed impacts and the pressure and the weight of all of these knock on effects just take their toll on people. I was really sobered by that, and, I, and yet I see that in the midst of that enormous possibility for the breath and a move of God. You think God is in heaven like, you know, checking out? No way. He is hovering over chaos exactly like he did in Genesis. Then we've got staying at home. People have gone local. Our masks back. Will we have to wear masks to the office? Will I want to go to the office? Will employees have anybody in the office? Will the coffee shops go broke again? And greatest of all that burdens me is youth. Our young people have suffered the most in the pandemic. They are the ones that have suffered most extraordinarily. Do you remember how many people here aren't under 30? Raise your hand. Give it, come on, be loud and proud. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Yeah, you're all fessing up now. Do you remember how long it felt, how long one year felt when you were a teenager? Do you remember, like, am I ever going to get a boyfriend? Is it going to be the year? And do you remember how long that year felt? Or do you remember how long it felt until you were going to finish, you know, your school certificate or your HSC or your finishing certificate? It felt like forever, didn't it? Tell young people to stay home for two years. They don't want to stay home for two hours. <laughs> two years. And they just have screens to communicate with. Think about that. Think about young people and a year. Think about two years. And the researchers are saying that there's the most um, psychiatric distress, loneliness, disruption to study, housing, access to jobs, and domestic and relationship violence is, for our young people, is at an all-time high. And the amazing thing is, in this time of great uncertainty, I want, this is what I want to bring this morning, this message about sacred spaces in anxious times, that Jesus promises us his peace. And that's not like a little high that we get if we come to church and, you know, the worship sort of, you know, is something you feel like you can vibe. That is a real thing. His peace is a real thing. And I just want to share some simple, simple, but what I feel burdened on my heart to bring today, that this gift of peace, it's an inside job. It's not out there. It's not the absence of problems. It's not the denial. It's not trying to, you know, uh, fake it till you make it. It's not being, you know, like trying to pretend it's not, it's not all going on. It's an inside job. It's a work on the inside. And in the Greek, when Jesus said peace, that word in the Greek, it's, I, I can't say it in the Greek, but it's E-I-R-E-N-E, -E, Irene, and it means harmony, tranquility, safety, and lack of strife with God. And it's linked to the Hebrew word shalom, which means wholeness and all is well with the Lord. So they're, they're pretty, it's not like a magnesium spa at the gym or a float tank or any of that kind of, you know, short-lived stuff. This is a heavy duty piece that you and I have been promised for the realities of life that we are in. And I sense even this morning there are, of course, in a room this size and people online, some of us are in deep, dark valleys. We're in valleys and they're not, we're not getting through them quickly. And I want to assure you this morning that the Lord 
He is the God of all peace. The God who says, I want to give you this gift on the inside of tranquility, safety, harmony, and a lack of strife with God. So if I may, can I unpack just some simple, might seem obvious to you, but simple, simple things that peace requires. And the first one is this this morning. If you're taking notes, I hope you are. Peace requires relationship over rituals and exploits. Peace requires relationship. There's nothing wrong with rituals or liturgy and how Hillsong does church and how the Baptist church does church and how the Catholic church does church. There's nothing wrong with liturgy and the way we do things. There's nothing wrong with doing great exploits for God. That's an overflow of this very point I am talking about. I want to say this morning to um, young people that are growing up in church, like our children have grown up in church. Sometimes growing up in church, you might be in 20s now, you might be in your teens. Sometimes you can get maybe saved to church culture more than you do to Jesus. And a lot of us who love our church, some of us were brought up in other churches, but it was like religious, it just didn't click. And we came here and something clicked and this fiery relationship with Jesus started. But when you grow up in, a, in church, you can sort of miss it. You know, when the conferences are coming up, you know how long the music's gonna go for, you know the offering's gonna be there, you know how they're gonna land it, you know who the worship leaders are. You can know the form of church, but that's not relationship, amen? Relationship with Jesus is what it is all about. So in um, Luke 15, 5, verse 16, this is something that Jesus did all the time. This is just one verse. And it says, But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. There are so many times in the Gospels where it says that Jesus withdrew to isolated places, lonely places, the wilderness, to a boat, to a quiet place with His disciples. He did this one thing continually. It wasn't just like, you know, pow, kazam, miracle, crowds, awesome. He, he always withdrew to quiet places, to be with His Father, to these beautiful, private, sacred spaces that nobody knew quite what happened there. Mark 1 verse 35, another verse. And I believe this morning, the Lord's saying to us, Hillsong Church, I'm inviting you as a church, I'm inviting you as a community to make sure that you again in everything that that, you know, we wanna do unto the Lord, that we are people that are found in those sacred, private, special places with Him privately. It's an invitation. Why are we afraid of the quiet? Why am I afraid of the quiet? Why do I, and I'm sure a lot of you, fill up our day with busy and with noise? Why are we always distracted? Always like, go, go, scroll, check this, that, song, hey, you know, do, do, the news. I put the news on in the morning the first time I went, why do I do that? Why are we afraid of the quiet? Even when somebody's talking to you about something really sad and we feel like we've got to go, it's okay, it'll work out good. Why are we scared of quiet? Why are we scared of that silence? And I believe when it comes to number one, that relationship with Christ over everything else, it means we've not got to be afraid of the quiet and the still. And maybe what we find if we slow down long enough in those spaces, maybe what we find is not much. Maybe we'll feel empty. Maybe we'll feel like we've come up short. That's exactly what the Lord wants. There's a whole book in the Old Testament called Lamentations. And it's about heartfelt pain and loss and feelings that God wants it all. I was at the prayer breakfast in um, Sydney where all church leaders gathered back in May. It's about 1,700 different church leaders from the church across Sydney. It was amazing. And I sat down with the CEO of a, I was at a table with the CEO of a, a very big charity. And this leader had lived in a lot of really heavy places like Congo and Syria, like lived there for, for years because they're an aid agency. 
And anyway, we, we, you know, it's a prayer breakfast, so we're praying, and I just said, you know, how do you pray? And I felt like not a very spiritual person when he replied to me. He goes, oh, I tend to not say much. I usually just sit and listen. And I went, wow, that's really deep. But I've thought a lot about that since I met him. And I th I've thought a lot about the places that he's lived in and the conflicts that he's lived through as an aid worker and how he's learned to sit and listen to Christ. There's this powerful verse in Genesis 3, and um, I think it's got our name on it as a church. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a drink. And it's when Adam had sinned and um, he's hiding from God. I mentioned this um, when I preached back at the end of May. That's what it says. When the cool of the evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And then the Lord called to the man, where are you? <laughs> Can you see it? Can you see at the beginning of creation before well, sin has just come in because they've disobeyed God and they're hiding, they're scared, they're afraid. And the Lord goes looking for them. And he says, where are you? And if you read Genesis 1 and 2, we learn that God is longing for our relationship. He is longing for your relationship, my relationship with him more than we are his. He longs for relationship. And I believe he's calling us as a church saying, Hillsong, people of Hillsong, where are you? I want to find you again in the secret, silent places. And if you think that's a monastery, you're wrong because the secret, silent places look different in different seasons of life, don't they? The secret, silent places can be when you're up at 2 a.m. or the mums are just dedicated your little ones with, you know, your partners. It can, it can look like 2 a.m. up with a little baby, just stealing a moment away with God. For me, it's looked like going up to Maru when I was young and single with my girlfriend and praying. It looked like walking the dog and sitting in my car when I became a brand new Christian because I wasn't allowed to read the Bible at home. So I had to walk the blue cattle dog and learn to pray at 41 Ride Street, Epping, where I grew up in the western suburbs of Sydney. And, you know, it can look like, um, for me now, it can be up late at night, not able to sleep. You know, um, as it says in Psalm 63, verse 6, on my bed, I remember you. And I think of the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, verse 23, when He's saying, you know, you did all these great things for me, but I never knew you. And I don't think God's trying to confuse us with that. I think he's trying to say, I want you to understand greater than all the things you can do for me. I wanna know you. I wanna know you. I want you to know me. I don't want performers. I don't want puppets. And I'm not suggesting we are that. I'm saying, where are we putting weight? And I just sense that the Lord's inviting us and calling us to these beautiful places in Him. And that word, I never knew you, is gnosko. And it means to recognise, to discover and understand, to know thoughts and to be intimate, almost as in a, not sexual way, but as intimate, like as in a couple are deeply intimate in that sexual part of their relationship, to be really known. Know God, not just, oh yeah, I got saved from my sin and now I'm living for God, I'm doing all this church stuff. No, really know Him. And it's a wrestle, isn't it? It's a fight at times. Um, for me, last year, um, August to December, really, really tough months. I had a scan for something in my head and they found an abnormality. And then I find myself in two neurosurgeon's offices. Look, whenever you're sitting with a brain surgeon, it's not a good day. It's not a good day. And um, they said, look, you know, this thing we think we've found, um, it's a ticking time bomb. If it, if it hemorrhages, you could die, you could have a stroke, you could be quadriplegic. Well, I'd love to say, do you know what? I just felt the Lord just come on me and... <laughs> He's awesome. I can't tell you, we weren't gathering, we were online. I can't tell you how I was up at night 
I had nightmares I was going to die. The, the first procedure to find this out, they said you could have a stroke, you have to sign a disclaimer. I'm like, I'm turning 60 this year. This isn't the 60th birthday present I was thinking. Thank you very much. And then if it was more surgery, drama, drama. Well, I found myself having nightmares for months. I really missed being in church. I missed the house of God. Look as awesome as Stephen and I are singing with Taya in our lounge room. <laughs> we pretty much just let her sing. <laughs> I missed the household of faith. I needed the people of God. I needed to get anointed for what this, you know, D-Day coming my way was. I saw different doctors to try and get out of it. And it, I was scared. I didn't have peace. But I remember when we started gathering at the end of November, I was sitting over there and I was just like, anoint me God, cover me God, I need to be around for my kids. I want another 30 years. I don't want to go now. I want to be able to walk. I want to be able to wriggle my toes for my 60th birthday. It's all I'm asking in the whole wide world. It's not much. But I sat over there for a good few weeks, bathing, bathing in His presence, trusting that every time we get up and pray that those prayers He's hearing them in heaven. Revelation says they're like aroma before the throne of God. This is a real thing. So I'm doing my work privately, trying to like help me. I believe, help me with my unbelief. I believe, help me with my unbelief. Are you even real? You know, all that. Oh, it's just me, sorry. <laughs> the good thing was, I remember the day I went to hospital, the lady looking after me was a Christian nurse from another church. We we're talking about Christmas spectaculars, and the surgeons were all beautiful. And I had the procedure and I woke up and I could wiggle my toes. So I was like, life's great. Couldn't be better. And they didn't find what they thought. It just said all that on the MRIs. Thank you, Lord. Done and dusted. <clears throat> but it doesn't always work with a bow like that, does it? Lots of things are just valleys that we keep, keep going through. So peace requires, number two, to check our hearing. We've got to check our hearing and listen for the chatter and the conversations that go on in our head and the automatic thoughts that come up that frighten us, that tell us we're not good enough, that tell us we're small, that tell us we shouldn't be sitting in the seat we're in, that tell us the person next to you thinks you're a total flake. You're not. We've got chatter. You've got it. I've got it. It's just called the human condition. But we've got to learn to hear God's voice and have Him cut through all of that chatter. And I'm not talking like I just feel, just feeling. That's called a snowflake Christian. Don't be a snowflake, a special little snowflake. I'm just feeling the vibe. How do you know to hear God? Coming in this morning, there was one of the beautiful families dedicating their little one and um, there was this cry and it was a newborn cry and I didn't even see them. They were trying to get all the kids out of the car. They were all dressed up and I heard this cry and I went, oh, I love that cry, but I hated it at 2 a.m. It was a newborn cry. And there was a sound that a mum knows when you have a child, whether you foster a child, whether you adopt a child, whether you're, you know, looking after your grandchild, whether it, you've birthed this child, there's a sound that comes from that child because you've spent time with it. And you get to know if it's a suki cry, a pouty cry, an attention cry, or I'm in trouble cry. And the worst cry is when they're silent. Yeah, especially when they're two and sticking things in the PowerPoint. You're like, it's too quiet, what's gone wrong? And you've just got this radar. Do you know zebras recognise their foals? Like how do, how do zebras recognise their babies when they've all got these stripes? Well, when a mum zebra has her foal, they go away for a handful of days and all that foal sees is the stripes on her face. And it's called imprinting. And that foal gets the imprint of her mum's stripes because like our fingerprint, every set of stripes is different. Every set. And it's imprinted. A lamb with a sheep, it's not the sheep's face, it's her bleat. They've all got a unique sound. Penguins, emperor penguins down the South Pole. You know, the ones like in Happy Feet where the, men, the males sit on the egg and the female goes off swimming for months to get all the food. You know that penguin? They um, don't have nests. So how do you find your family amongst hundreds of thousands of penguins? Well, there's a call that they make. They've got split voice boxes and they can make two sounds at the one, one time. 
And that little, little chick gets to recognise the sound of its mum and its dad because it's together. And that's imprinted. And in exactly the same way, we need to understand that we have to attune our hearts to hear God. And how do we start with that? Hebrews 4 verse 12, this is what it says, for the Word of God is alive and it's powerful, and it's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So listen to me, particularly if you've grown up in church and you know this sort of all you've known, it might get a bit boring along the way. Can, you, can I encourage us to not just listen and feast on podcasts of other people's version of this, or YouTube, as good as all that is, but to go to the source ourselves and to learn to let the Spirit of God speak to our hearts with His Word. And that Word, when it says the Word of God is alive and powerful, that's a Greek word that means logos. And that word logos means the sayings, the teachings, the commands and the instruction. And also one of the names of Jesus is the Word. And the more, that, and I'm not talking about, oh no, I should bang it on about 20 minutes in the Bible every day. No, I'm not. I'm like, however, you are gonna get with Jesus and His Word, whether you download it on the app and listen to it when you're driving to work or on the train, commuting or whatever. Let the Word, the written Word, not just a verse, but the Word, the context, the chapter, the story, the tone, the questions, the wrestle. Let the Word get in on the inside because it starts to show us who Jesus really is. And when we get to know His voice, we can have His peace and His wisdom in our real world. I go for a walk on Corinda Drive with my daughter on some nights with her dog. And there's a house we walk past every time she goes, Mum, can you hear the UFOs? I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, can you hear the UFOs? They know I'm coming again. And apparently there are these frequencies that certain house alarms have, but you can only hear them if you're young. And I went on YouTube last night trying this out and I wasn't organised enough to play it for you this morning because we're going to get copyright and legal approval so we don't get sued by somebody around the world because we're Hillsong and they think we're a bank. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> ka -ching. You have no idea. Everything's got to get approved. And there are these sounds that young people can hear that if you're 60, you just can't hear. So we kept doing the test. No, no, play it again. I did it 10 times with my kids. Play it again. I'm going to get it this time. They're like, can't you hear it? I'm like, no, no. You'll all go home and YouTube it, won't you? <laughs> Try it. It's hilarious. And there are vibrations, like vibrations sound like megahertz from I think it's not to like 20,000 hertz. And the older you get, the less you can hear. No matter what our age, We've been wired to walk with God. As Dr. Henry Cloud said it this way, it's something I read this week, this whole idea of bonding with the Lord. Bonding is the ability to establish an emotional attachment to another person. It's the ability to relate at the deepest level. Bonding is one of the most basic and foundational ideas in life and universe. It is a basic human need relationship with God, with Him, and with our fellow people. And when we truly, this might sound really, I'm sorry if this is really fundamental to you today, but I just feel impressed of the Lord that He is inviting us to a deeper place, corporately, individually. When we sit with Him and bond with Him and listen to Him and talk with Him, not show pony stuff, not facade, not I've done all this, I'm so awesome, but the real heartfelt stuff. Some of us know what it's like to have lonely marriages and kids that are distant, even though we're with them every day. I believe that you can go deeper, like really deeper. That's what the Lord wants and that's what we crave for. And when, when we allow His Word and, and to be able to hear Him, it changes our perspective. The world looks different. Things change. It lifts us. 
What seems permanent isn't permanent anymore. And this is a place he's inviting us into, this sacred space in a world of anxiety and pain. If Dave and the team could come up, that'd be cool. And the last thought, Launceston and Geelong and online, is this. Peace requires the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation. Listen to this power-packed verse out of Ephesians 1. 17 and 18. This is my 1982 Bible that I got when I became a Christian. I went straight down to Kurong. I was like, I don't want to join a cult and get brainwashed. I bought a dictionary, concordance, commentary, and this little Bible. And it's got every prophecy word, message, word at my baptism, everything stuck in it. It's iconic. But this is what it says in the NIV. I keep asking that the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And he goes on, I want you to know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. What an invitation. A spirit of wisdom and revelation. Anybody who's under 40 online, Geelong, Launceston at Hills, listen to me. Following Christ is not a cerebral experience. It's not all in our head. I don't think the church has ever been more educated with people's degrees and, and, and it's fantastic. But I, I wanna challenge us this morning. This isn't just a cerebral experience. This is a, a, a promise of walking with God Himself, of walking with the presence and the power of God in our life. And at Hillsong Conference, we had a guest speaker come and he turned things a little bit upside down and we're like, get God back in the box. And I just think he wants to, and I'm not talking about manufacturing anything here, I'm talking about the Lord. He's like, I'm God and I wanna walk with you. And young people, I want you to listen to me as much as, this, you know, whatever they say in the st stats about young people, I am so firmly convinced that God is pouring out His Spirit on young people afresh, afresh in our church. I believe if you're a youth pastor at this time, you've got one of the finest jobs going because I seriously believe that God in the midst of this darkness that is over our earth is pouring out His Spirit. And like His Word says in Chronicles, His eyes search to and fro across the earth, looking for hearts after Him that He can strengthen. And if you come to Bible college from the other side of the world and you're sitting here and you're starting semester, you know, first semester halfway through the year, don't worry, God sees you. And if you're in a dark valley right now with health or family or yourself or something's collapsed, you know, you may be being made redundant. Don't worry, He sees you. His hearts, His eyes look to and fro across the earth looking for hearts that are after Him so that He might strengthen them. That's actually in 2 Chronicles, if you want it, 16 verse 9. And, I, and I'll finish with this. There's a young lady from Ukraine that we've been in touch with and another family. Pastor Yuri wants these people to come out to Australia. She's a young woman, she's 18. She volunteers in our fuel ministry in Kiev. When she had to leave because of the war with her family, they, let, they had 15 minutes to get out and that was it. They're in Germany now, they've got nothing. They've got no money. She hasn't got money for air, for money for anything. And Pastor Yuri said, I really believe she's meant to be out here in Australia during the war. She's awesome, young, fireball, she's 18. And this week her visa got denied, which is a real bummer, but we're fighting. And um, good things are happening behind the scenes there. We're just gonna keep advocating. And even if she did, you can't get an airfare out of Europe right now. Next two weeks, you cannot get one airfare from any country to anywhere. It's just gone crazy. And yet she wrote to us this week in an SMS. She said, I feel like God told me, I've already booked a flight for you and everything is okay. Just prepare yourself. This little firecracker is 18. She's in a war and she's scared and they have absolutely nothing. And yet she senses that God has said to her, don't worry, we've already, I've already got the ticket and we have already got the funds because you've given it. And I just am inspired by her faith. I got a photo this morning before service started of another couple. She's been in Germany and Croatia and he's been trapped. And this morning he's with her. They've actually got a visa. We just can't get them on a flight. This is miracles in motion, but people walking deeply with the Lord. 
young people listen to me, people in your 20s, people in your 30s with young families. Do not allow your walk with the Lord to be ritual, to be exploits, to be cerebral. Jeremiah was 20 when God called him. Joseph was 17 when God gave him a dream. Mary was probably 16 when she got asked to carry the Saviour of the world. Joseph, maybe 18. The disciples, they weren't all these grey haired, you know, things out, guys out of like Lord of the Rings. They were teenagers. They were teenagers. They were just young and had youth to burn. And I look at these people in the Bible that, that we, we, we just think are so iconic. They were just young, but they knew God. David, he just was like, how dare Goliath take us out? I'm just gonna go for it with my little slingshot. God put His hand on him. None of them had it immediately turn around. They all had silent years to follow it through, but went on to do great exploits. But where did it start? Secret place walking with God. Can you stand to your feet with me this morning? If you're young, and you can decide if that's you, and you're drawing a line in the sand, I've, got, I've literally got a few minutes. If you're drawing a line in the sand and saying, I'm going deeper with the Lord, I'm gonna be in church, but I'm gonna be found in the secret place, whatever that looks like for you. I want you to race down here really quick. Really, really, really quick. Because I just know in our church that God is gonna move through our youth. God is moving through our youth. I sat with youth all through conference. I loved it. I watched these 15 year olds go ballistic. They just went ballistic for God, praying, come on, squash, squash, squash. Come on, we'll us down. Come on, Dave, lead us in that song, the, that bridge that you did before you did the, you know that song? I don't know. What did you do? Yeah, go for it, quick. We've got to do this quick. Come on, come, lift your, I can't do it. It's time for you. Seth, time for you. Come on. Okay, just so you know, this isn't an exclusive thing. It's only for the young. I just feel this morning, on Sunday morning, to just draw that line. And I want you guys to see yourself as people that are gonna fan the flame of God for our new generation. And you guys are gonna do exploits like no generation before has ever, ever, ever seen. You know, historically, plagues have come and church leaders like Luther and Calvin rose up and invented all kinds of medical and social solutions before they even knew there was a thing called a germ. So don't worry about what's going on the outside. He has you and He's gonna take you to wild and crazy places and just be up for the adventure. Don't look to people to do it for you. Put your hands towards not just these young people, but young people online listening, young people online at home are just not, just not sure anymore, maybe a bit cynical, maybe a bit disillusioned. Father, this morning in the mighty Name of Jesus, may You mark this generation with a fire 
and a hunger that is gonna shake the church, take her to places that we've never been. And Lord, may every individual know that Your hand is on them, that they are unique, majorly amazing and beautifully made. No mistakes here, Father, and that You're with them in the struggle. You're with them in the things that keep them up at night. You're with them when they feel lonely, Lord. And may You, Holy Spirit of God, be so deep and so present in Jesus' mighty Name, Amen. And Brie, I just wanna encourage you. You're like Hannah in the Bible. You're just always found in the house. Don't you dare think you're not a pillar. You're one of the, you are such a strong pillar in this house. And I just reckon if the, if the world knew the private things that you pray and do and who you choose to be, they'd be breath, breath, breathless. Because you are a woman that's always in the house. And I'm not saying that like a club membership thing, guilt trip, got it? But your just heart is for the Lord and heart for His house. And I just, I, I encourage you to listen more because He wants to stretch and move and do way, way, way more through you. Not use you, but do things through you because you have a heart that's just leaned in. And um, he, he wants, he, he just needs that more. Okay, Sam, I'm done. You need to f- help pray for people. Can we because, put our hands no. together for Donna, guys. <laughs> Everyone stay. No one move for a moment. No one move for a moment. Please. Who felt like God really, not just spoke to them, but is really drawing you back to Himself? Who, who, who really felt that? Yeah, fantastic. It's true. There's no doubt the Holy Spirit is drawing us back to Himself. And so with that, everywhere, whether you're online or, or maybe even watching this later, you're not watching by accident. Maybe Geelong, Launceston, here. Maybe you're new, if it's first time, You might have come because of the baby dedication or you've been coming for a little while, but you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus. Well, that's who I'm speaking to right now. Because what you need to know, God loves you. Jesus is real. He is the missing piece. He is the only one that can quench that thirst. He is the only light that's gonna remove the darkness. He is the only one that can satisfy that deep down craving. It's Jesus. See, God loves you, you're not an accident. We saw that, we talked about that earlier in the service and and He chose you. That's why there's a sense that there is something about you that's different. He put that there, that your life is worth something. But the problem is this, We've all sinned, you've sinned, I've sinned. We're all in the same boat together. There's no sin worse than any other sin. And the result of any sin is that it separates us from God forever. And we all are in that boat. And religion can't get you back. Nothing can get you back to God. Nothing we do is gonna ever be good enough to pay the price for our sin, our disobedience, our desire to do life without Him. That's why Jesus came. If you wanna know how much God loves you, He sent Jesus, His Son, to take your place and my place for our sin to be punished on Him and through Him. The Bible said He became sin and He took the wages of our sin upon Himself. Why? So that in Him, when God rose Him from the dead, in Jesus, we could find forgiveness of our sin. But it's not just just about going to heaven one day. That forgiveness of our sin means that God who's up there somewhere in your life now becomes the God in here. He is what is missing. And I'm gonna pray a prayer right now. I'm gonna ask all of us to pray this together. But if you genuinely wanna know Him, then accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. So can we close our eyes? Can we all pray this prayer together? Dear Jesus, I thank You that You died on the cross and rose again. I have sinned and I ask that You will forgive me and I accept You as my Lord and Saviour and I choose to now walk in Your way. In Jesus' Name, 
Amen. Amen. Can we celebrate? Can we really celebrate? The Bible says you've gone from darkness to light, from death to life. And what we wanna do is not just celebrate with you if you've prayed that prayer, but we wanna give you one of these Bibles as a gift. Online, you can say, I prayed that prayer and we're gonna reach out to you and get, get you a Bible. But in any of our locations on the way out, can say, you know, there's someone waving these around, go and get that from them. Say, hey, I did that. And can I just say also, if you wanna know more about what Donna's talking about, come and talk to us at the Welcome Lounge or the Information Desk. We actually run Alpha. Alpha is a great starting place for anybody that actually really wants to know who God is, who we are and how we can actually walk with God. And that's starting in, uh, this Wednesday. So make sure you do that.